Hey, Joanna. Hello. How are you? Hi, Hi Joanna. Good. How are you? Good. <laughs> I'm in a messy location today, so my camera's off. <laughs> Looks like we have a few folks still entering, so we'll give it another minute or so before we get going. They're still coming in. <laughs> All right, well, I think we can go ahead and get started. We might have a few more folks trickling in, but uh, welcome everyone. Hello, uh, my name is Rachel Williams and I'm an assistant professor uh, here in SLIS. Uh, I'm also a faculty member in the Information Science and Technology concentration. I'd like to officially welcome you to day two of the 10th annual Allen Smith Symposium. Uh, first, Simmons List recognizes that the land on which we work and study is the rightful heritage of peoples known, including the Massachusetts, Pawtucket, Pocumtuck, and Nipmuc peoples, as well as peoples unknown to us. We gratefully respect not only their attachment and claim to the land, but the centuries of stewardship, which allows us and our institution to prosper here. As grateful but uninvited guests on this land, we will continue to work to be accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. As we begin day two, I'd like to share uh, a quote from Professor Alan Smith, who said, librarianship is a field where anything you know will only help you anything. Uh, this is relevant broadly for all of library and information science, including reference services, um, issues related to social responsibility, um, and particularly in the case of this symposium, um, that quote applies to how we engage with and understand the connections between technology, innovation, and equity. These are vital issues that impact our work as information professionals, as educators, and as scholars. I will address these topics today in part through um, our first event for the day, which is a panel discussion moderated by uh, Professor Naresh Agarwal, um, who is also the director of our SLIS Information Science and Technology Concentration. So I'll hand it over to you, Naresh. Thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, even though we're not meeting in person today, but uh, I really want to welcome our panelists and all our, all our guests today uh, uh, to Simmons uh, virtually the and I have a background out here so you can see that spring is in the air. So it's nicer weather, weather and I hope that uh, this COVID pandemic that we have uh, will be behind us in a few months. So, so hoping for all the good times ahead. So the theme for today's panel is innovative technologies, opportunities and challenges. And uh, our first panelist is uh, Ken Fleischman, who is a professor in the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin, where he also serves as the founding director of undergraduate studies for the iSchool's new informatics major as well as a founding chair of Good Systems, a UT grant challenge. His collaborative research has been recognized with various awards such as the iConference Best Paper and Best Short Research Paper Awards, the ACES Six SIG Use and Six Social Informatics Best Paper Awards, the Metro Lab Innovation of the Month for July 2020, and the 2019 Civic Futures Award for Designing for the 100%. Our second panelist is uh, Melissa Villa Nicholas, who is an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Rhode Island. Her work focuses on the history and practices of uh, 
uh, Latina, Latinos with information technologies and information spaces, uh, Latina, Latino social techno practices, immigrant information rights, new media studies, race plus uh, gender technology studies and critical approaches to information science. And uh, our last but not the least panelist uh, is Ben Salzman, who is an instructional designer and virtual reality augmented reality technologist at Hamilton College. In addition to, to teaching digital media technologies, he has led the school's efforts in researching the use of XR technologies for teaching and learning. His academic work has been featured by the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, Educause, HP, CBS News, and NERCOM. So welcome you all, uh, Ken, Melissa, and Ben. And going with the theme, which is innovative technologies, opportunities, and challenges, I invite each one of you to, to make a brief presentation. Uh, so each one of you will have about uh, 15 per minutes uh, per presenter, uh, and you can talk about uh, your work with respect to the theme of today's panel. So I invite you first, Ken. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Naresh, and really great to be here with my uh, co-presenters and all the wonderful audience. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about starting a research grand challenge. So I use this um, title uh, borrowing off of my uh, former PhD advisor who, uh, in the field of science technology studies, wrote a book chapter. So you're thinking about uh, living in STS, a uh, guide to the perplexed to think about what it would be like to enter a new field. Um, and that was part of what made me want to choose uh, the science and technology studies field. And um, in this case, I actually wasn't thinking about starting a research grand challenge when I moved to UT Austin. Um, I think if two things that I definitely would have said were never gonna happen were um, starting an undergraduate program and being at the head of one of three campus-wide grand challenge research initiatives. We're a very small school and I couldn't imagine either would be possible. So it's been, it's been quite a ride. Um, but I want to talk about some of the experiences here. I think we're grappling with some really huge societal challenges and it takes a really big, uh, broadly representative inclusive village to be able to uh, make progress in the face of those challenges. And specifically for good systems, our focus is on the ethics of AI. So artificial intelligence, of course, has great promise and potential, but also has a lot of uh, potential downside as well. So we're, uh, good systems is one of uh, three bridging barriers grand challenges. They're all moonshot goals. Um, they were designed from the bottom up. So this is one of the exciting things about uh, the uh, Bridging Barriers Grand Challenges at UT Austin. And I think a model that other universities can follow is instead of the upper administration of the university deciding what the priorities would be alone, um, they uh, solicited a series of white papers uh, from faculty, uh, did a bunch of uh, different brainstorming exercises and eventually wound up with uh, three Grand Challenge initiatives that were driven by faculty interest. First Planet Texas 2050, then whole communities, whole health, and finally, good systems, UT Grand Challenge. Um, and so designing AI technologies that benefit society is our grand challenge. Uh, we were launched in uh, 2019 uh, by the president at the State of the University Address, uh, working to ensure that the needs and values of society drive the design of artificial intelligence technologies. In my work, I've always been driven by the core values of librarianship, especially the orientation of service to, to the community. Um, and I think it's really important that um, we take a user-centered approach to technologies like artificial intelligence that have such broad implica implications and ramifications. Um, so to give you a sense of the scale of this grand challenge, these are, I think, a not quite up-to-date list. Uh, there are probably a few more uh, of the units uh, departments, schools, colleges, and other units on campus, uh, ranging from uh, you know, the UT libraries are here, also the medical school, um, also um, TAC, which is one of the leading supercomputer centers in the nation, um, as well as the School of Information alongside departments like uh, CS and uh, computer science, electrical and computer engineering. So it's been quite a challenge to get this group of uh, faculty, uh, research staff, and students from across the university to come together around tackling these big issues. The big issues we've been trying to tackle, how do we define what a good system is? So we're envisioning a good system as a human AI partnership, but what does that look like both on the um, 
the sense of what is good, which is something that many societies around the world have struggled with for thousands of years, and we haven't come up with any conclusive uh, definition that works for everyone around the world. And also in terms of this socio-technical system that we're envisioning with good systems, exactly what that looks like. Um, the next one is um, how to evaluate good systems in terms of if and to what extent they are good, and then how to build good systems. And so um, then we're also looking in our, uh, this is for our first four years, uh, then for the next four years, our challenges are uh, best practices for designing good systems, how we can share these best practices with industry, and how we can prepare students for the jobs of the future. So we've launched uh, eight research focus areas. So they are critical surveillance inquiry, disinformation, fair and transparent AI, future of work, public interest technology, racial justice, robotics and machine learning, and smart cities. And of course, there are you know, so many myriad opportunities to do exciting research uh, in ethical AI that's a broad societal relevance. These are just eight of the areas, and we just started with, with these eight areas. Um, to give some examples of some of the good systems projects, I gave examples that I'm most uh, familiar with. Um, so one, we're trying to look at how uh, broadly inclusive the design of digital assistants is and uh, to ensure that they align with the needs and values of all children. Another is looking at specifically uh, uh, privacy preferences of people who are uh, blind or have low vision in terms of when they're using visual question answering systems. Um, and another is looking at, um, so the notion of smart cities, we think also should be good cities. So it's important to look at equity and in particular think about how AI can be used to empower and better serve people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, the ethical, legal, and policy implications of AI are really important. So we've done work on um, looking at the field of AI generally, and then also specifically for uh, students in our uh, ALA accredited master's program at the UT Austin I School, um, who are planning to go into careers in libraries and archives and thinking about how AI is going to transform uh, the, the field of librarianship and the field of archivy and thinking about maintaining that human touch, that human connection, even as we increasingly adopt AI that allows it to, us to scale up our efforts. Another project is the Microsoft Ability Initiative. And uh, this has been focusing on uh, visual question answering systems for people who are blind or have low vision. And it's uh, been really exciting to think about how AI can serve specific user communities and how we can use technology in some cases, if it's left, you know, if we just leave things alone in an un unregulated capitalism, then what we're likely, you know, what we tend to find is that uh, technologies often increase, unfortunately, the gaps in society. Uh, but when technology is designed intentionally to try to uh, empower and provide the most good to the people who could benefit most from the technology, then it can be a force for equity and good in the world. Um, so this is an example of focusing on a specific community and trying to work to meet the needs and the values of that community because a concept like privacy, for example, is very context specific. Uh, different people have different information needs and you have to understand the, indi the individual who's asking for the, the information, not just provide uh, generic captions that are supposed to be one size fits all across all users. Um, also, we've been looking at uh, mis and disinformation. Um, th uh, and um, so this is a project funded by Micron Foundation, uh, but actually I have a doctoral student, Kalina Kultai. Um, this was pretty pressing. And I remember her coming to um, my office the first day of the semester in August of 2015 and saying, I want to uh, study the anti-vaccine movement. And I looked at her and I'm like, okay, um, we had talked when you applied about doing stuff in trust and transparency in, uh, in uh, aviation systems. That was what she had been uh, working at JPL on in the past. And that's what I thought we we're gonna do, but she was very motivated. I was thinking, well, let's see how long this will go. If this is something she'll wanna do for a month or a year or what. And she got her dissertation. Uh, she is uh, now at the Center for an Informed Public at the University of Washington, one of the night uh, foundation funded uh, centers in disinformation. 
and um, has been all the different media. So she picked just the right topic at the right time. And sometimes if, uh, you know, when you choose a topic, when you choose to focus on something, you might just need to think about, uh, you might, you know, I think it's important to keep at it. So it might just not be the right time. So I actually started uh, focusing on ethics of AI in the previous millennium. Um, and originally it was, oh, this is cute. This is the sneak uh, niche boutique kind of thing that you have going. And I'm glad you're thinking about the ethics of these systems so I don't have to. But now it's great that everyone has to think about uh, the ethics of AI systems. Um, so we've been trying to, you know, to make sure that um, that we're aware of the implications and the designers are thinking about ahead of time. So we've uh, done a couple events uh, facilitated by the Public Interest Technology University Network, which is convened by Ford, Hewlett, and New America. Um, and we we held a conference in um, in uh, March of 2020 early March 2020, just before the pandemic started. And right now we have a social justice informatics faculty fellows program. It builds on the social justice informatics concentration that we offer at the undergraduate level at uh, UT Austin. And we have a partnership between uh, nonprofits such as Measure and Capacity Catalyst, um, Good Systems UT Grand Challenge, the Texas I School, um, the oldest university in the city of Austin and also HBCU, Houston Tolson University, and the city of Austin government. And uh, last project here is uh, looking at trust in public health information during a pandemic. So this is how uh, it's possible, of course, uh, many of us have uh, adjusted our uh, research agendas in light of the pandemic. And although it's been a horrible uh, tragedy for the whole world, and it continues to be a huge tragedy here and especially elsewhere in the world now, unfortunately, and hopefully we are, as Naresh said, getting to the end and going to be in a better place. But while we're still here in this pandemic, we've been trying to see if we can make a difference, both in this pandemic and thinking about the possibility of, of future pandemics down the road. So I wanted to end with a couple thoughts about this, again, sort of audacious notion of uh, putting together a research grand challenge and any kind of interdisciplinary collaboration there are huge challenges, but I don't think any one, with due respect, I don't think any one discipline alone is prepared to tackle the broad range of challenges that we face. So I think it's really important that we do build broad interdisciplinary collaborations. So this requires building a shared language. Um, it takes a long time just to be speaking the same language. The same words mean different things in different scholarly communities, and the same concept is represented by different terms in different communities embracing methodological differences and uh, also navigating the competing reward structures. So uh, audiences that uh, people were, were aiming uh, for monographs versus journal articles versus conference proceedings papers. That's been a bit of an advantage for us in the iSchool in taking on something like leading a grand challenge across campus as we've had, of course, this challenge of handling interdisciplinarity within our own school. So I think it's something that iSchools in general and the LIS field is well prepared to lead nationally and internationally in putting together interdisciplinary research at a time when, of course, uh, convergence is one of the 10 NSF big ideas. Um, building mutual respect and trust is critical and also keeping everyone's units happy. So you have these uh, barriers, uh, that's why bridging barriers, the barriers that are posed by the different uh, schools and colleges and departments and units across campus. It's, these can be hard to navigate, but if they're navigated well, we can really form exciting interdisciplinary research collaborations. A lot of the neat, exciting ideas come from these kinds of collaborations. So why do it? It's the opportunity to scale research campus-wide. I never imagined getting to do or even be involved in something like this, but it is exciting to get uh, you know, a whole group, of, especially students, to see a bunch of students, we've started a signature course, which is part of the first year experience here at ET Austin on ethics of AI. So we're getting ethics of AI students, uh, sorry, we're getting students from across campus, first year students across campus to think about the ethical implications of AI. We had a bunch of uh, engineering students there. We also had a bunch of students uh, from music um, and other fine arts. It was really a fascinating combination of social science and technical, uh, humanistic and artistic uh, students. Um, expanding the audiences in terms of the academy and also looking beyond uh, to train students in interdisciplinary research, 
have an educational impact, as I was just talking about, and getting to do societally relevant research. So um, thank you all very much. I'm looking forward to the next uh, presentations and uh, to the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ken. That was fascinating. And we'll move on to the next panelist, uh, Melissa Villan-Nicholas. Over to you, Melissa. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Simmons and all the faculty for the invite. It's great to see familiar faces and um, meet a lot of you that I didn't get to meet this year at Elise. <laughs> so it's good to be able to connect with everyone. Um, so right now, my research is looking at how Silicon Valley is building an industry out of immigrant data. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and go into the sort of different parts of this, um, but um, I'm from Southern California and I'm Mexican American, I'm second generation. So my grandparents came here from um, Mexico. And this is um, personally, I'm looking at this from experiencing borderlands, um, physical borderlands growing up about an hour from the Tijuana border. Um, and then looking at how the, these new data borders are sort of building and um, becoming more and more of an industry. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna look at my notes like over here. <laughs> um, so in March 2018, Congress approved the $1.3 billion budget for a border wall, and that included um, $400 million for the virtual wall. Um, it's estimated by the Office of Biometric Identity Management that the Department of Homeland Security will be conducting 180 million biometric transaction a, transactions a year among 220 million unique identities. So that's like face scans and fingerprints and uh, retina scans and DNA. Um, the virtual border wall was approved without the fiery debate of the physical border wall. It's more of a bipartisan agreement because it's considered a more humane approach to um, surveilling the border. But rhetoric surrounding the virtual border wall included promises beyond just physically stopping people. It includes promises of collecting more data, um, which means sort of fueling the innovations and engineerings of new technology in Silicon Valley. So we're increasingly seeing Latinx immigrants data and particularly bio data engaged as the surface for which information technology is mobilized. Um, recent investments in the collections of bio data on the border and data throughout the country has become a highly profitable industry. And um, truth out has estimated, but this estimate keeps going up that this will be a $740 billion industry by 2023. I call um, what I'm researching, the state of what I'm researching, Data Body Milieu. Um, Data Body Milieu is the emerging state of borderland surveillance that brings all people, citizens, and immigrants into an intimate place of surveillance where our data lives together and defines us in digital data borderlands and places Latinx immigrants at the center of technological innovation and development. So borderland milieu is um, sort of this phenomenon that Oscar Latino studies um, scholar Oscar Martinez described of how people live on the border. And that's really how I grew up, which is just different cultures together interacting. There's tension and xenophobia. There's hybridity of cultures. Um, there's relationships. Um, they adopt each other's values. You know, sometimes there's conflict. This is a particular state of borderland milieu. And then we have the data body, which we're really familiar with, I think, in LIS. But that's the sort of state of our data transactions happening, um, which I think we saw increasingly like we'd sign up for um, you know, use our telephone number to sign up for points at the grocery store. And we like thought that was a little weird. And then we suddenly started using our emails to sign up for all kinds of benefits online. And our data body just sort of grew into now what is a highly valued industry um, of data. And, you know, Sophia Noble talked about this yesterday, how um, that industry and those 
the bias, sort of the race, gender, sexuality, is always kind of considered within that data body. She calls that technological redlining, um, which is how our data might determine we get loans or our access, we can access healthcare. Um, so um, that data body moved very quickly over the years into wh where we are now and um, replicates larger systems of race, cis sex, gender, discrimination, and class. Um, Ruha Benjamin calls um, this idea of the new Jim Code which is the employment of new technologies that reflect and reproduce existing inequities, but that are promoted and perceived as more objective and or progressive than the discriminatory systems of a previous area. So we really see the um, rhetoric around the smart wall and this technology as more humane than past systems. Um, so data body milieu is our social media, media data and library databases and DMV data. Um, and many other data, um, all working together to build this new borderland of surveillance and deportations and incarceration. Uh, Latinx immigrants become valued as a data body, one that is used for purposes of technological design and um, launches technological innovation. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, these sort of new data borderlands. Um, the first talk of a virtual or smart wall began in 2006 um, by the Department of Homeland Security's Border Initiative with Boeing, and um, that was considered a failed project. But um, we see that like past border initiatives and tech on the border were done by a lot of defense companies such as Boeing, um, previously Hughes, and then there was this move over time to engage more Silicon Valley companies. So in 2015, um, the Department of Homeland Security opened a satellite office in Silicon Valley. And a lot of the language around opening this office is to engage in Silicon Valley's like innovation. So they say to engage entrepreneurs and innovators from small startups and large companies, um, the SVOs mission is to tap this innovation of the private sector in new ways. So that's um, sort of the ongoing theme here is this merger of commercial tech um, with military tech. So then in 2018, we had Congress approve the um, virtual border wall, so known as the smart wall. And um, this is a time where we see a real shift into tapping Silicon Valley um, tech development. Um, those tech companies could start bidding, actively bidding for government contracts. Um, and they had been, there has been that relationship, but this was sort of opening that up even more. Um, so to make bids for this new digital border wall, Silicon Valley is relocating more offices physically into the Southwest. Um, one of the biggest of those companies is Anderol Industries, which is located in Orange County. And um, there are also other companies that are opening offices like Quantergy Electric um, in Texas to sort of be able to test out the borderlands, test out their um, infrastructure in the borderlands. We'll talk about them a little bit more in a bit, in a couple slides. Here are just a few of those sort of Silicon Valley companies that have government contracts with ICE. So Amazon provides web services. They have the largest web cloud ser services. So they store a lot of the data. PayPal, um, BI3, Quantergy, which builds the tech for self-driving cars, um, has proposed to build a 3D smart wall. Palantir um, has been doing this for quite a while. Anduril Industries, um, it came out of Oculus. Um, I'll talk a little bit about them in a sec. Clearview AI, which we hear about a lot recently in the news because they're like constantly gathering face scans and then getting in trouble and then just like moving to another state or city and doing it somewhere else. And then LexisNexis Elsevier, which brings us in library and information studies into this realm. So um, the Latinx immigrant data body is valued for the purpose of technological design and valued as a source of data in and of itself. Um, this is just one like 
pitch by the company Co-Fire Solutions of how they would build a digital wall. But I show this as more of an example of how like companies are pitching for these government contracts. So they're setting up um, different pitches for how they can grab data on the border and then um, throughout the country. And then um, more and more biometric data is increasingly valued. So in 2018, when it was sort of notorious that families were separated at the border without a record of how to bring them back together, 23andMe um, volunteered to use DNA for reunited families. Um, DNA had previously been used by um, Homeland Security for like immigrant refugee entrants, but um, they were after 23andMe um, offered to do that, ICE started to use DNA um, more and requires it now to identify individuals as family at the border. Um, so I'm kind of keeping an eye on that because of just how valuable um, DNA as data is. And one of the things like when I say data body Mulu, like one of the things that I think kind of describes it the best is I grew up like 70 miles from the border, an hour's drive. The um, data that's being held um, is in Massachusetts by Andy, the company Andy. Um, and that's like 70 miles or 60 something miles from me here in Rhode Island. So that's a way that like the border is just always present and always around us. Um, so one of the things that I'm looking at is how um, immigrant data is sort of going into um, different AI and technologies. Um, and then that can go back out into the commercial um, sort of sphere. So like with Quantergy Electric's um, proposal to build a 3D wall, data obviously would be gathered and be able to improve those systems. And then there's no difference between um, that military system and the commercial system. So data kind of goes into that product, improves that product, and then can go back into the commercial realm. And that sort of cycle is happening between um, borderland surveillance or military tech and commercial realm. So that's one of the hopes of um, these tech industries is to merge more of like the military and the commercial. This is a quote from Palmer Lucky, who's the head of Android Industries, previously the head of Oculus and who had a little stake in Facebook, but who left Oculus to establish Android. He says, in China, there's no difference between the civil sector and military sector. It's all one thing. That's why when you help Chinese companies work on artificial intelligence, you're almost directly helping the Chinese military work on artificial intelligence. A lot of people in Silicon Valley don't really understand this. So that's a big part of a lot of these companies is to try to merge um, those two parts of industry. And um, Lattice is one AI um product that they're using on the border and so they're using different sensors a lot of the infrastructure that's already there such as sensors and then um, Andoral is building really high-tech products such as drones um, and they're using the ai to mine through like to locate who's a human what's not human who's a target that then they want to send border patrol out to investigate um, there's a sort of, there's a lot of reference to storytelling that I won't go into here, but like Andrel and Palantir and one of Palantir's um, uh, products, Gotham. Like, so there's a lot of use of, Andrel and Palantir reference Lord of the Rings. So there's a lot of use of like storytelling in that like these companies are the heroes and then the bad guys are the people on the border trying to cross through. And there's just this larger storytelling arc um, that I talk a little bit about more in the book that I'm writing. Um, but that storytelling arc sort of is like uh, places the tech designers at the like hero's journey. Um, and then I describe Citizen Milieu is the ways in which we all sort of touch the data borders, whether we know it or not. So when we're using Amazon or when we're using um, reference seeking tools such as LexisNexis and Elsevier that at any given time we're a part of um, this ICE network. 
Um, so one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Jeannie Austin, who's a critical information theorist and San Francisco public librarian, they ask, at what point do you lose control of yourself as a point of information? Um, and then this is just, did I miss my libraries? Oh yeah, so libraries are also um, ingrained in this state of data borders through LexisNexis and Elsevier. Um, and there's a book coming out called Data Cartels by Sarah Lambden, who's a CUNY law professor and um, librarian or former librarian that I'm really excited about um, who is really going to break down how sort of how we got here with LexisNexis and Elsevier, um, the Relex group. Relex has like the same um, value at like net worth as Google. So she's really asking that we look at um, at Relex and all of these database vendors that we work with in librarianship, the way we scrutinize Facebook and Google and Amazon. Um, and then just a slide on um, ways that we can advocate for more um, immigrant data rights. There's the Our Data Bodies project that you can check out, Electronic Frontier Foundation, Mehente and Immigrant Defense Project. What we're really seeing is that this sort of the immigrant rights movement is organizing around data rights, um, including undocumented people in upcoming data privacy bills. Sarah Lambden is advocating as antitrust comes in the next couple of years that we include Relex and LexisNexis as part of that. And then also check out Library Freedom Project, which is doing a lot of great work. All right, I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Stop sharing. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was, uh, I think, really uh, timely and, and, uh, and something that all of us must be thinking about. And thank you, thank you for doing this work. So we'll go on to our next presenter, uh, Ben Salzman. Yes, thank you, uh, Melissa, and thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, that was a wonderful uh, talk and also related to the moment of having students in VR headsets uh, in the library space. Um, so this is my field specifically. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Everyone see my uh, screen okay? Yep. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk about um, some opportunities and challenges that we've had specifically in this uh, XR uh, technology field. And when I'm speaking of XR, uh, I mean specifically um, extended reality, meaning uh, that includes virtual reality or augmented reality or sometimes mixed reality. Um, and uh, we're in an interesting point of uh, time uh, with the new Oculus uh, Quest 2 that was released. Um, and uh, there has always been a conversation about privacy and um, data, but we're now in a new age um, with that headset being released. Um, and I'll uh, discuss that uh, a bit further. But first, uh, so I work at Hamilton College. We're a small liberal arts school. Um, for those not familiar, about 1,800 students. Um, and uh, we pride ourselves on having a, a small classroom. Um, we offer a, a private liberal arts education. Um, it's not uncommon to have one faculty member for uh, eight students in a class. Um, and I think because of uh, this small um, network of um, disciplines, and uh, we've had a lot of success in uh, um, utilizing XR technologies for uh, projects. Um, specifically, our work has mostly uh, been sponsored actually by HP. Um, and uh, I have to give a thank you to HP. Uh, we participated in their Campus of the Future XR uh, research project. Um, and uh, we contributed uh, 11 projects uh, in total of using XR technologies um, for teaching and learning. Um, some of the participating inst uh, institutes um, in this uh, uh, grant um, funded project were um, Harvard, uh, Yale, MIT, um, FIU, Syracuse University uh, really did a wonderful job. Uh, based in, um, out in Syracuse is doing great uh, things in the Newhouse uh, School of Communications. Um, and really with uh, the support of uh, Educost, we were able to um, uh, publish a good amount of articles with your own Jeffrey uh, Palmer. <laughs> and I have to thank Jeffrey. Uh, he did some wonderful publications. Um, the first publication was Learning uh, in Three Dimensions. And um, this was a wonderful report. I'll um, 
put some links into the Zoom. Um, the Learning in Three Dimensions um, uh, highlighted some of our work along with uh, Yale University, who's doing excellent work utilizing XR technologies. Um, also, the next uh, um, publication, Extending XR uh, Across the Campus, um, featured a lot of uh, great projects uh, actually in libraries um, across institutions. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, uh, let's see, it was last May that uh, Jeffrey uh, published XR for Teaching and Learning. Um, and uh, there's some wonderful information and really the, um, the guiding core concepts are still what uh, we're utilizing um, for uh, our exploration with XR technologies at Hamilton. Uh, we're really looking at what are the modal outcomes that uh, hold the greatest potential to improve learning outcomes in the classroom, right? Uh, enhancing student engagement, but also improving fac uh, faculty satisfaction um, using uh, the technology. Um, and we were really asking how uh, can we utilize XR technology to better prepare students uh, to have digital skills uh, in this right digital age. Um, and also uh, some of the skills, specifically Unity, which is used for designing virtual reality experiences, uh, we're starting to see being uh, extremely sought after um, by recruiters uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, so, yeah, we're actually going to be partnering with Unity to um, join their uh, academic alliance um, and start offering certifications um, for students who do want to um, get into designing uh, in the platform Unity. Um, really what we found from uh, doing a lot of these projects, and I'll provide some case studies in a little bit, is that uh, 3D technologies and the adoption of it on campus really requires uh, collaboration with multiple departments. Um, perhaps that's uh, obvious, but uh, what we found was a really a strong success rate because we collaborated in a field um, like music, uh, even literature, um, and also uh, computer science, obviously, they are doing coding to begin with, and there's a strong uh, connection to uh, virtual reality um, and XR technologies in that uh, science. Um, but we also found that uh, not only does it take time for the benefits of 3D technology to be realized on campus, it requires a lot of outreach. Um, this has been three years uh, of working with multiple departments to uh, complete around. Uh, 11 projects, um, and we're still seeing the adoption even during COVID, though uh, things have changed quite a bit. Um, uh, for the sake of time, I'll just go um, through this pretty quick. Um, we've, uh, some of the highlights of some of the projects that we've done, we've taught human anatomy uh, with VR. We had a biology uh, class. Um, instead of their final exam, utilize virtual reality to do a, um, uh, basically an exam that showed that they um, understood uh, how the anatomy functioned. And they had to spend 30 minutes in a VR headset and do an oral communication presentation that was recorded. Um, I'll play a little bit of an example. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to utilizing virtual reality uh, for um, teaching in this way. Obviously, cadavers are extremely expensive. Um, and virtual reality offers opportunities to actually see uh, animations of uh, how diseases affect uh, organs. Um, we're seeing a large adoption of uh, um, colleges and schools utilizing um, virtual reality specifically for uh, teaching anatomy. Um, and you can also see that there are uh, opportunities to highlight um, specific diseases. For example, um, let's see, in the uh, next slide, you'll see uh, CPD and how that's affecting the lungs. Um, so it, it's a um, it's a really wonderful field um, that uh, an area that VR uh, can highlight. And we also uh, did a interesting project with our music department in which we utilized virtual reality um, to uh, teach uh, orchestra conducting. This was highlighted by the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, and for the project, we utilized a 360 um, video camera that was placed at the perspective of the uh, conductor so that students in the class could actually uh, experience what it's like to be at the podium. Um, as you can imagine, uh, doing, uh, having a whole entire orchestra um, for students to practice with is financially impossible <laughs> and also uh, uh, very um, unrealistic. Um, for their final exam, uh, students in the class were able to spend three minutes in front of the orchestra um, conducting uh, Brahms' symphony 
um, and uh, they were able to experience it. But before doing so, we um, had them uh, utilize the virtual reality experience to see if that helped uh, calm stage fright and if that helped them um, for their final exam. And um, uh, the survey showed um, that students did find it useful, but also this is interesting, 56% um, of the students uh, had used virtual reality and augmented reality before, and I think we're seeing this, um, that uh, the younger generation and uh, millennials are, have actually already utilized uh, virtual reality in some way or been introduced to it, um, and we're certainly going to see that now with the new Oculus Quest uh, headset that was released. Um, uh, students uh, um, found that it uh, served um, to increase uh, uh, greatly, um, uh, increase their confidence uh, conducting the orchestra, but we uh, got general feedback um, that they really wanted the experience to be immersive, fully immersive. So we worked with our uh, computer science department and coded that 360 video in Unity so that you would actually be able to hold the controllers and you would be able to control uh, the tempo and speed um, of the orchestra. Um, and it was another example of really collaborating across uh, different departments to make a long-term project work. Um, just to uh, close that, some of the, um, <laughs> we're in a very interesting time, obviously challenges. <laughs> uh, COVID has been one of the largest challenges for all of our institutions, right? Um, and especially at libraries. Um, and we've seen uh, that massive uh, amounts of virtual reality labs have had to shut down uh, during COVID. Um, obviously a headset is very difficult uh, to share. Um, it's not an ideal uh, piece of equipment, uh, especially during in times of COVID. Um, so we're uh, currently looking at cleaning devices, but uh, this is what uh, the equipment essentially looked like for um, Hamilton um, at our uh, um, VR space um, in our library. We would have um, a HP Omen laptop connected to a TV like you can see in the right um, so that people could see what uh, the person is experiencing in virtual reality. Uh, also, this is portable and I uh, really recommend this to any um, uh, institutions that are thinking about um, utilizing uh, virtual reality and starting to get equipment. Uh, make sure that you're portable. Um, uh, the, especially with the uh, new um, Oculus Quest um, and also other HP equipment, um, the ability to start uh, utilizing uh, all-in-one headsets is only going to increase with time. Um, but uh, cleaning equipment, obviously, uh, this is one of the biggest reasons why COVID uh, shut down so many labs um, uh, across, um, well, internationally. Um, and uh, we're going to be implementing a solution, uh, which I uh, give credit to the University of Michigan. This is the first time that I heard about um, the device being used. It's a clean box, essentially utilizes UVC light um, to clean headsets so they can be used publicly. Um, uh, that being said, uh, I'm not endorsing green box in any way, um, but we are investigating its use for um, this coming fall, uh, uh, hopefully uh, if we are in person in the fall. Um, but uh, to go back to what Melissa was talking about, we're really in an interesting time right now with VR um, in that uh, with the release of the Oculus Quest 2 um, and other private uh, companies, uh, we're seeing that the data that's being collected is of extreme value. Um, and it really uh, is shifting the conversation um, about responsibility, digital citizenship, right? And what that means to millennials. So many of um, the millennials in general have uh, been used to uh, having Facebook um, or having social media of some way. And um, to understand what um, the collection of their nonverbal footprint means. It's something very new, I think, to that generation. Um, and really, uh, who's leading the way um, right now, it's the Virtual Human Interaction Lab. It's uh, Dr. Jeremy Belson. He's doing incredible work. And I'll put some um, links in the chat. Um, they uh, recently published, um, one of his students, uh, Mark Roman Miller, um, published a great study about um, personal uh, identification and essentially um, how uh, simple it is um, to track, I shouldn't say simple, but um, 
Uh, the Oculus Quest headset, for example, um, is a 90 hertz headset, and it tracks large amount of data, um, your body movement, and um, it only takes about 20 seconds, um, or at least from what the study that I'll um, paste in the chat uh, showed, um, less than five minutes of tracking data um, out of a pool of 500 um, participants, uh, it had a 95% success rate of identifying that unique person in VR. Um, and there's a lot of impl implications as well um, about uh, our nonverbal footprint and how that can be used. You can uh, understand. Uh, you can understand gender. You can understand um, uh, uh, intelligence and things with how someone learns. Um, and this data is very valuable. It's one of the reasons why um, the Oculus Quest Two is actually so cheap. Um, the Oculus Quest 2, many of you have probably seen, it's uh, $299, and this is by far the best headset um, and at the most affordable price point. But you have to remember that that price point um, is very specific. Um, they have released a headset that can be used by um, educational institutions and essentially not having to link to Facebook, but that $299 headset has to be linked to a Facebook account. And um, Facebook is very uh, honest about um, the user agreement and how they are tracking the data. Um, so uh, we're left in an interesting conversation of how much is your data worth? Um, the uh, headset um, at the enterprise level that uh, doesn't, uh, you don't have to um, connect to a Facebook account is $799, it's a $500 difference. And um, this has uh, opened up a very interesting conversation. Um, and some uh, other companies are uh, responding. Um, AP recently released their uh, G2 Omniset uh, Edition headset. And what's so exciting about this headset, um, it tracks um, eye movement and uh, heart rate, and uh, it is by far one of um, the uh, highest resolution um, displays. Um, and also, uh, HP has gotten behind uh, making sure that um, BRP and FERPA um, and privacy um, concerns uh, aren't as uh, much of an issue. Um, we're also seeing an interesting point in time in terms of uh, alt space and uh, people using educational um, opportunities uh, to have groups uh, in VR. Um, and we're seeing uh, colleges start to use um, uh, alt space and even Mozilla hubs um, for a way for uh, students to all meet together um, at one time and be able to interact and uh, share videos. And um, even as you can see in the right hand corner, study molecules, um, it's a very interesting time uh, in our field. Um, so I'll leave the rest for questions. Thank you so much for the opportunity to pre present. And please feel free to contact me if you have uh, any questions about anything that I uh, just showed. Thank you so much, Ben. I think uh, this is fascinating. So we only have worked seven or eight minutes uh, before we wrap up the event. So I think if you all have questions, you can put them in chat and, and we'll try to get those questions out to you later. I, I was just looking at some of the themes that emerged from, from the talks today. I think from uh, Ken's talk, there was this idea about building a shared language while embracing differences that came out towards the end. And in, uh, we, we looked at a lot of current and emerging technologies and in Melissa's talk uh, that came about this idea of potential for misuse in a lot of ways in terms of how a data can be taken and misused. And I think some of the privacy and security concerns came up with in your talk as well, Ben. And we, there was one theme about the educational implications of implementing innovative technologies and that Ben was a lot in your, in your presentation, I think. So one question maybe uh, that I had, uh, so we've had these conversations about uh, trying to have more uh, blended sort of an education where we have hybrid meetings because sometimes you have a purely online meeting like right now, or you have a face-to-face -face meeting but the difficulty is like, how do you have those uh, hybrid meetings where most people are, on, are, on, are in person, but some people are online. And we find that the online people are sort of second class people, like they're not heard or they're not like at attended to as often as the face-to-face -face people. So using your VR and AR, AR technologies, and I think you talked about uh, Mozilla Hub and all space VR and all that. So what are the ways in which uh, more hybrid meetings could be made uh, possible now that a lot of people are moving towards a hybrid world post-COVID? That's, that's a wonderful question. Um, 
and um, I'll, uh, I'll paint some links as well. Um, uh, Dr. Jeremy Belson actually at Stanford University has been doing uh, research in terms of uh, Zoom exhaustion, right? Um, we're all feeling it. Um, and also it affects the classroom, but also you're completely right. There is in hybrid classrooms, there is this uh, issue of equity. And if someone is virtual, if they're in Zoom, really, how are they able to contribute equally uh, to class? Um, and I think in terms of uh, XR in the field, um, we're starting to see some interesting work done um, with IR depth sensors in terms of biometric video and seeing if there's a way to start integrating that. But um, I think in the uh, um, shorter term before um, uh, holographic video and um, uh, starts becoming a leg presence, I think we're going to see more of the web XR, meaning places like Mozilla Hubs, where uh, people are all able to meet, but they're still able to kind of bridge this strange hybrid um, uh, kind of VR avatar yeah. <laughs> uh, world. I think we're going to start seeing that develop. Um, but it's certainly, it's a difficult time we're in right now. Um, and it's been interesting seeing how higher education has adapted. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, so I think, I think it's, it's difficult and exciting both. I think it's, it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's a new world. I'm, I'm sure we're not going back to the pre-COVID world. It's, it's going to be new. And we had been moving towards, but I think in some ways the pace has accelerated now towards more online and hybrid approaches. Thank you, Ben. I'll move on to, to Ken. So, uh, so Ken, moving on to the theme of building a shared language while embracing differences, how do you propose we go about doing that now that we are in such a fractured world and, a, and, and we find that the more we are trying to bridge our differences, the more the differences are also getting wider. So there is this tussle, and I think this tussle has been going on for, for generations and centuries. So how do we, how do we bridge that going forward? Well, Nourish, that's a great question, really challenging one. Um, so I think, whew, um, so we have to make sure that we have all of the relevant stakeholders at the table. So that's a really important part of this. Um, and that's something that, that both LIS scholars and STS scholars have been talking about. In many cases, there are relevant but absent stakeholders. So in the case of IT, we often think about the end users of IT. We don't think as often about the people affected by IT. And there are many people who are affected by IT who don't have, who don't directly use it and they don't have any say in how it's designed. Um, so I think we need to first think carefully about all the different stakeholders who are potentially invested in an issue think about ways to productively engage those stakeholders together and to build conversations. Those interestingly also could be, you know, in person and or virtual, synchronous and or asynchronous, combining different elements. Um, we've been thinking of a, a similar issue to the question that you asked Ben and Ben's answer, because we're uh, one of three universities uh, in the sort of global organization of iConference 2022. And we're organizing as a virtual conference. We still want to have in-person gatherings as part of that. So we're planning for plenaries to have in-person gatherings to watch the plenary. For workshops, you can imagine having five, six, seven universities as satellite sites where the breakouts could happen in person at the universities, but the you know broader discussions could happen through uh, Zoom or another medium. So, so figuring out the right communication modes, also again translating language and getting stakeholders to to talk and have productive conversations. But I think there's been a lot of promise and potential that we're able to uh, aim toward um, restorative justice and trying to make the world a better place and trying to respect uh, the rights of all people. Um, so I think we would have to, we'd have to have that. We'd have to have everyone buy into um, and be committed to that goal. Um, and I think most of all the technologists and the folks in government would have to listen. So it couldn't be a top down, uh, you know, Elon Musk decides everything. Um, it would have to be something that we were, um, again, able to do it from, from the bottom up uh, and get stakeholders together, get us organized around uh, points of common cause and try to make the world a better place Thank you so much, Ken. And we have about a minute, maybe. So, Melissa, any any one final thought from on your end in, in a minute? 
Um, well, just that, I mean, as we're thinking about activism or like around trying to bring in all the voices, you know, there's a lot of different approaches. There's like individual, but then there's also these collective groups getting together. And so I just think that there's a, as much as I feel like my, my work is like a downer, but there are so many groups that are get, getting together and at, and actively asking for their own rights to data. And so I just think we're going to keep seeing a lot of these groups like Library Freedom Project emerge where there's these creative responses. And Sophia Noble mentioned some great work yesterday. So I just think there's a lot of responses out there that, um, you know, just like Ken was talking about, like that engage different groups to design, you know, new and good, good tech. I like that, um, that language. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. So thank you all to all the panelists for the wonderful presentations and, and for being here. And we'll take a break now and reconvene at 3 p.m. for student lightning talks and a brief panel discussion with our information science and technology faculty members. So thank you so much. And uh, Professor Rachel Williams will be putting the, the Zoom link uh, up, uh, over here. And I think we also have questions that, that are coming in, but uh, I think that's for Melissa and uh, we'll try to send that to you later. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you everyone for being here. Thanks.